Today, uh, we have the pleasure of uh, talking with Mary Griffith, and we are, of course, going to talk about unschooling, uh, but also a little about fencing, uh, <laughs> because I read on your home. Yeah, you don't actually see into the future. No, no, so but I will start asking. I will start yeah. asking about fencing um, and go into what? unschooling uh, later, uh, because I saw on your homepage that you uh, have been, or presume you still are, very happy about fencing. And I'm like, how do you end up with an interest like that? You homeschool your kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically, basically, years ago when the Antonio Banderas Zorro movie came out. And my older daughter said, Mom, I've always wanted to do that because the local paper did an article about local fencing clubs. And she says, I've never asked because I never knew there was any place that we could do it around. So she started fencing and she did it for about a year. And, and after, after my younger daughter's unfortunate experiences the same year with the soccer team that had already been together for three years and she'd never played soccer before. So that turned out not to be a great match. But she decided to fence too, and her older daughter decided, well, I guess she could do the same sport as me. And Christy is the one that took at. She's now a collegiate col college, or she's a college fencing coach in Cleveland, Ohio now. That is fun. So, so she, she decided when she was 15, she wanted to be a fencing coach. And she went and she majored in exercise sciences and kinesiology in college and had a fencing scholarship and worked at a, a recreational club for about 10 years and now she just got a just this year started with cleveland state and how did you then get yourself into fencing was that well i was one of those people when you're when you're there are crazy sports parents and then there are parents who try not to be crazy yeah <laughs> and i don't know if sports youth sports has got the same kind of weird parent thing in europe no. that we do here i mean it's it's, it's nuts yeah. here yeah, it's, it's just, you know, and it's connected with the school and people want to yeah. do great sports because they, they'll help their kids get into Ivy League schools. And yeah, it just very, it's nuts. But I discovered that I could not stand next to the strip and watch my kids fence and keep my mouth shut without my stomach churning. And somebody said, hey, why don't you help me come run the computer and help run the tournament? It turned out I was good at that. And it turned out I was going to as many or more national tournaments as my kids were because eventually I became chair of USA Fencing's tournament committee and I was running national champions and stuff, which was an experience. Let's say I have a somewhat jaundiced attitude about the administration in the Olympic movement. The athletes are great. Yeah. Some of the coaches are a little weird. Some of the parents are totally nuts. It always, the athletes are great. And the sport is great, but USA fencing is a little weird too, because if at the time we got involved, they were growing about 20% a year and not adjusting their tournament qualification paths fast enough to keep up with the growth. So we had cases where I was running tournaments where we got there at the venue at six o'clock in the morning and fencing started, you know, we had opened up the venue at seven for fencers to come in. Fencing would start at eight and sometimes it would go till midnight or even later. Because there were so many people. Yeah. I mean, we had summer nationals that I ran. I think the biggest one was just under 10,000 entries over 10 days. Wow. It's not it like, good. it doesn't look like the Olympics. It looks like this vast, you know, you, you can see on some of the old posts on my fencing posts yeah. where I talk about the frustrations of it getting big. But if you get me started on fencing, I can go on for hours about all sorts of things administratively and everything. So I don't know that we necessarily want to go into that. I think maybe we are more here for the unschooling. Maybe. <laughs> I would think so, yeah. yeah. But that's that's actually one of the reasons that we liked fencing, because it was a great sport for, you know, because it was a club sport. It wasn't a school sport. So there wasn't that that sort of worry about getting involved in it. It was all private and we, we didn't have to worry about getting out of school to go to tournaments or anything. And it turned out to be a lot of fun and it worked out really well. And it turns out there are quite a lot of homeschoolers involved in fencing because it's a very flexible sport that way. Yeah. Okay. So other sports, I'm just not from the States, so educate me, please. Other sports, you'd have to be enrolled in a school. In there, are, a, there are, there are, there are especially at the high school level, high school level is where there's, you, it's funny, I looked, when I was in high school, 
which I graduated in 1971 from high school, so secondary level school. And at the time, there was women's gymnastics and there was cheerleading. And I think there was a girls basketball team. And there were 13 boys sports. Yeah. And, you know, if you were a girl and you wanted to be a runner, you know, or do some kind of track event, you had to do it through a private running club. But like basketball, baseball, um, I don't know if they had soccer then. They have golf, tennis. um, Not sure if the boys had gymnastics, but, you know, there were in, in track and field, you know, and that's all run through the schools and school leagues and stuff. No, but it's so, out of school hours, but run by. It's after school, so, after school. So only kids from the school stuff. can join but, the. Right, club. right, okay, right, and there's yeah, scholastic leagues different. and things. Yeah. yeah, and there are also private clubs, but they aren't anywhere near as big a thing as the school. No, but clubs. in a country where you only have private clubs, where they are like not private, some of them are not. Yeah, private, I mean, some of them like- are public, public funded. You know, and they're more for parks and recreation programs. Mm. that the city is so public funded everything right all of the sports so yeah the united states has or fencing or whatever it's a it's a club but it's not connected to the school it's nothing to right. do with right school. right 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 mm-hmm. which actually seems more logical to me but you know i don't know <laughs> I'm not here to judge. at least if you have uh, if you have schools children outside of the school system it's more accessible it's hard for them because because yeah. they don't have any access to it some states will allow homeschools that homeschoolers that aren't enrolled in schools to participate but a lot of it depends on the state athletic associations rules too so it varies from state to state and school district to school district because it's all it's all locally managed it's very strange okay it's a huge country, though. Yeah. And and New Jersey, the state of New Jersey has fencing scholastically, but I think it's the only one that has statewide yeah. fencing as a sport. Okay. And in the what, schools, you, I mean. you, what I can hear is you're more involved in the back end of the whole fencing. Do you fence yourself? Does oh, you... I have never so much as put on a mask. I have held a blade. You have held a blade. But I have not. Blood. Okay. <laughs> the thought, yeah. the thought of fencing myself just makes my arthritic knees hurt just thinking about. It. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. okay, but but the whole uh, homeschooling and and uh, unschooling. Um, how old are your kids now? And when did my you- younger daughter will be thirty five next month? Yeah, and my older daughter is thirty. She'll be thirty nine this year. So and they're almost our age. Yeah. We, 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 we pretend <laughs> to be a little younger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll be 70 in July. Wow. So it, it, it was funny because listening to your interview with Patrick Ferenga, and I realized he was younger than I was, which is funny because, because he was affiliated with Holt and Holt was sort of one of the guiding lights when I was getting yeah. started. I always assumed he was older than I am, mm. you know, so it was funny when he said he was 62 and I went, huh. Yeah. <laughs> How weird. But I didn't have my kids until I was thir- in my 30s. You know, I was 31, I think, when Chris, when Kate was born and then almost 35 when Christy was born. So I, I didn't start young. No, but what, what made you? We did start the homeschooling really young because I had a, I was old enough to have opinions of my own. And uh, I think I saw John Holt on an Oprah show. Oh, or no, it was no, it wasn't Oprah. It was before Oprah. It was on the Phil Donahue show, which was on started in Chicago. And it was the first real big daytime national talk show eventually. And he had John Holt and a bunch of homeschooling families on. I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. And then while my kids were still under school age, I came across Don Holt had a book called Teach Your Own Mm. in a bookstore one time when we were browsing. And I picked that up and I read it and I thought, yeah. We're going to do that. I pretended we were just thinking about it for a couple of years, but I knew we were going to do it all along. <laughs> it was it was easier to tell my mom we were thinking about it because it did take me a while to quit yeah. trying to persuade my mom that it was a good idea. Once I quit trying to persuade her, she got much less worked up about it. Mm. And then there was one time when I think it was Kate was about 10 or 11. And she said to my mom one time when we were over there, she says, Ma, Grandma, why don't you like it that we homeschool? 
and my mother just went, <gasps> you know, it's yeah. like, oh, I don't mind that you homeschool. And she really shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's one of the, the, the big ones is the fear of uh, what other people would think. And also the, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. me, it was the insecurity also. Um, but also, yeah. I, and the right mothers, it's a big thing what it's mothers big, think mm -hmm. the grandparents mm -hmm. it's a big thing and they yeah. will influence the children because it's such a close mm -hmm. relation yeah and i do yeah. coaching i very often talk to mostly women sometimes yeah. talk to the parents and their largest concern usually is mother and mother-in-law mm -hmm. biggest problem they have yeah which is amazing when you think about it when you have several yeah. children you have to take care of them every day and there could be something with the finances, something with the house, something with, but the problem well, is the mothers. It was really funny because my mom at the time when we started was working as a docent in a museum library in Sacramento and near where we are. And mm -hmm. she had mentioned that I was homeschooling and mentioned a couple of the people that, and, and the librarian that she worked with, and she says, oh, I know those. We had those. And when I was working on my master's degree, we were learned about all those people. And so suddenly she had, like professional, I had professional credibility because Kathy in the library knew about the people I'd been talking about. And I thought that was, I was endlessly amused at that. It's like, and, and my favorite comment that my mom made when my, my first book came out, which is another story entirely, how we got there. It's actually pretty funny, but, um, she said, and it's actually my next. She, she read, so she read, she looked at my it. book, she looked at my book and she says, it's surprisingly well written. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and she didn't even hear what she'd said. <laughs> no, but, but I, but I Mary, still laugh at that one. Uh, 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 so, if we can go through your books, and why did you decide to write books about homeschooling and unschooling? What well, happened? I had been involved. There were there were issues about how homeschooling in California would stay legal, and I was involved with a. a Northern California Homeschool Association, which later became the Homeschool Association of California. Eventually, we had big debates about whether whether we could go statewide or not, because there were Southern California homeschoolers that had their own ideas. So it took a while. But I was involved with this group and we had <clears throat> we were basically keeping an idea on whatever legislation would get approved in, or proposed in the legislature, because it's a lot easier to stop something being passed than it is to change something once it becomes law. Mm -hmm. And so we were just keeping an eye on the legislation and keeping an eye on various counties, because also the counties are the, were the place that it's enforced through. You know, so I was I was on that. And we had we had a network of what we called county contacts that were people basically like you're doing the the uh where people could call and ask questions about homeschooling. And the local county office of education had my name as the local county contact. And she, she called me one time and she said, we've had a question, uh, you know, is it okay? A publisher is looking for advice from us because they want to publish some homeschooling books. And they said, it, we, they said, is it all right if we give them your name? And I said, oh, sure. So eventually this publishing company called me and they said, we think there's a market for curriculum for homeschoolers. Would you be willing to send us some information and stuff? And so I said, I got, you know, like the Hageners Home Education Magazine and, and copies of Growing Without Schooling and some, some various articles. And I sent them a packet of stuff and, and they had me up there for a meeting one time and picked my brain, you know, what's the market like? How many people, what kinds of things do people do? Then about six weeks later, they called me back for a meeting and they said, we have, we want to run our idea by you. And they had, they said, we're going to make these kits. And they had this cardboard box. It was kind of like the box games come in and they had a, a blank board game and then they had some little cut out pieces of cardboards that were various different, you know, there's a square and a circle and a triangle and a trapezoid. And those were going to be for the different parts of speech, you know, like for verbs and nouns and stuff. And so somebody was going to make up a board game and there was a book there too. So I pick up the book and I flip through the book and it's blank. <laughs> and they said, we're thinking about a price point. And this is in the late 90s, mind you, about yeah. 96 or so. They said, we're thinking a price point of about $50. And I just started laughing. <laughs> I said, 
I said, number one, you don't have any content here. No homeschooler. <laughs> you know, I can't give you an opinion about how good this program is if there's no content yet. And they said, no, oh, we're no, just going to no. hire somebody to write the book. You know, it didn't matter to them much what the content was. No. And, and I said, number two, $50 is not a price point that homeschoolers are going to go for. They're going to buy a lot of books, but they're not going to pay $50 for one subject area. No. And <laughs> I said, it's just not going to fly. Mm. And so I went away. And uh, about a couple of months later, a different editor called me from the same publisher. And they said, We're, we've dropped the curriculum idea. And it turned out they had fired the editor that had come up with an idea. And apparently there were countersuits involved. <laughs> and they were suing each other and stuff. But they said, we think there's a market for a trade book. and that was kind of funny because at the same time, some of us in the, the homeschool association had been thinking, you know, it'd be fun to write a book because at the time, the only books that were published were through the Christian market, which was the, the what I think of as the, I mean, you can see the effects of that school of thought in American politics over the recent years, but it's some of the people that were involved in the religiously based homeschooling at the time have gone on to be big deals in Republican politics, which is kind of depressing. But uh, I always thought of them as the wacko Christians, which was yeah. inappropriate, but practical, uh, as opposed to the, you know, there were the wacko Christians who were in the religious groups, and then there were the, the other religious people that were normal that didn't have any objections to hanging around with atheists and agnostics and people of other religions. And those were the people that were in our group. Yeah. But anyway, um, they said, would you like to write a book proposal? So I wrote up a, a book proposal, which is basically an outline and what, what was out, because what was out was either personal experiences. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with the Colfaxes, Mickey and David Colfax were a big deal just before yeah. I started homeschooling because they had been, he had been a sociology professor and she had been a teacher and they were very active in the anti-war movement and welfare reform and stuff. And he eventually got fired from his job and got blackballed and they ended up suing for the being a conspiracy basically to keep him from being hired at any other university. And he got a settlement and they bought some land up in Mendocino County on the coast and ended up raising goats and four sons, three of whom went to Harvard as homeschoolers. And so that, that was kind of a big New York Times story for a yeah. while. And, and they came and spoke to a bunch of our conferences that we used to do where we'd get homeschoolers together and be drive the hotel people crazy because they had no idea how to deal with kids. But <laughs> um, they, they, there were personal experiences. Here is how my family homeschooled. And mm -hmm. there were the religious how-to guides, but there wasn't a regular plain trade book about if you're interested in homeschooling, here are the things you need to consider. And that's what this book was. And I hated, hated, hated the cover. And I'll show you why. You see that pencil? Yeah. yeah. You probably can't see it on the screen, but one of the things that the pen, there's a word on the pencil and it says success. Oh no. Ooh. And I just was <laughs> livid about that, but I couldn't oh, persuade no. him to change it. No. Okay. But it also sold out its first printing eight days after it was released. Wow. So they started okay. taking my word better about what the homeschooling market was like. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So. But, but in your own life, how did you move from, uh, from homeschooling towards unschooling? Oh, we started out unschooling. Okay, you we started, started unschooling. We started, we started unschooling. Yeah, yeah but you don't that, that was, it came through, came through Growing Without Schooling and, and John Holt's newsletter. And I had been reading that for a couple of years before my older daughter turned five. So, and, and it seemed obvious because you cannot watch a child that age play without seeing how much they're learning and exploring and doing stuff. And it's like, why would you want to change that? And how much fun would it be just to watch that and do things along with them. It's like, why would you want to send them off to be in a room for six hours a day or however long it was going to be? Once, once it's like, we were having idea, too much fun. Yeah. To me, you know, and then kind of the same. once you get the idea, once it clicks, it's like the curtain is being pulled and you're like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I was, I was one of those kids in school that, you know, I'd always have my library book with me 
And the first two weeks, the teachers would try to catch me out while I was reading my library book in class. And I always had kind of one ear out, just sort of paying half attention to see if there was something I had to actually notice. And after a while, they quit bothering me and I could read in class. But I always figured if they're going to be reading all day anyway, <clears throat> why not just do it at home where you can be comfortable? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and no one's disturbing you when that one eye. Plus, you could go outside and you can, like my younger daughter, especially, she was a, a fidgeter. You know, she was one of those kids when we're reading stories. And my one daughter would be sitting curled up next to me and the other daughter would be acting out whatever story <laughs> I would be telling. You know, they just have completely different approaches to, to doing things. And that was always interesting to watch, too, to see how people learned and how their process changed as they grew older, too. And then for a while, I was telling people, I said, you know, we're going to keep doing this until they both learn to read. And then it'll be up to them whether they want to go to school or not. And they, each of them, I think when they were about 12, briefly considered the idea, but having to get up early in the morning and having to do it every day, the same day, you know, I think, I think one of them thought about it for a couple of weeks and went, nah. And the other one, I think it maybe lasted five minutes. And they, yeah. they neither of them ever decided they were interested in going Our to school. Our children, they sometimes, well, especially one of, her, of one of them, our youngest daughter, she says, sounds as if it could be fun, but this everyday thing, I don't really have time <laughs> for that. You know, I, I could do it once There's a month. There's too much to do. <laughs> There's too much to do. I, what, how could I maintain my meaningful life if I had to go for six? I can't commit for six hours every day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she doesn't want it either. Yeah. It's the same reasoning, I think. And, and our um, um, oldest boy, he's 17 now. Um, he was curious about uh, high school and we one of our friends who our son uh, as he doesn't care if it's an adult or a younger child or someone in his own age they just talk mm -hmm. so our common friend is also one of his friends and they talked a lot about school because mm -hmm. this guy he's a high school teacher um, mm -hmm. and, and then he said to storm one day why don't you come with me one day to see what it is and I will just introduce you and you, you can just sit down and follow me a whole day. Um, and they then, then Storm took up with him one day and went to high school. Uh, and uh, he, it was a fun experience because he saw it on two levels. He saw both. Mm -hmm. How did the children uh, interact together? And Storm was thinking, mm -hmm. okay, what is going on? You are sitting here, but you're mostly on your phones and you're not following. So why are you even here? <laughs> um and the, yeah and the other part was our, our friend the teacher he had said to him before i go in these are the four different levels i manage uh, uh this a school class how i make sure there is um uh, quietness in the room so they actually have possibility to hear what i'm saying so so he told Storm about his different ways of trying to control a school uh, class mm -hmm. and Storm was sitting and watching it and they had a lot of fun. And um, what happened then was Storm was also like, yeah, I've seen it now that it, <laughs> it's not worth the time. Actually. Yeah, that's that's what they say. It's yeah. not worth the time. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, one of the things that helped with my kids was when they were fencing, you know, and they would be going to practice every day and in between lessons and things, you know, because there'd be the group classes and then there'd be the portion of the day where people are getting their private lessons and people would sit around and do their homework, you know. And so they got to see the homework that other people were doing. And Chris, Christy especially would look at it and she goes, I thought it would be really hard, but they're like, they're like answering stupid questions, you know, yeah. like, yeah. what was the name of the dog in the scene where whatever happened? And it's like, just they're not talking about the content. They're talking about stupid factoids. <laughs> and I said, you know, and there, there were other classes that were better than that. And there's some very good schools around there if you're interested in that sort of thing. But it wasn't anywhere near as rigorous or as scary content as she had it in her brain before she saw the kind of homework that people were doing. It was and then when she decided, oh, sorry, go on. I was just going to say when she decided she wanted to have a fencing scholarship when she went to college, 
she had to do some things that looked sort of like school for high school, you know, so she went and she got an algebra book and she worked her way through that and she, so she could meet the requirements to get into the university. But that was something she decided that she wanted to do rather than, well, that's you know, and, and we sort of had to re reverse engineer her transcript to look like something that the, you know, we said, okay, she knows these things. What courses must she have had in order to have learned these things? <laughs> Mm. you know so we have four years have? of english and, hmm? do you also reverse engineer plans um so kind of say after the fact oh yes we went to france because then they could learn to speak french and they would <laughs> <laughs> no we didn't but it sounds really nice when you text <laughs> yeah we, we basically we we made a transcript that looks sort of like a school a normal school transcript because mm -hmm. we have we figured it used to be when we had first started homeschooling, the NCAA, which really regulates college athletics, because of course that's another thing you don't have in Europe, I imagine, is the college-based, the university-based sports, no. which is a, a weird American thing. We don't have university-based people and, who live at university where we. Yeah, live. then the National Collegiate Athletic Association regulates athletes because they don't want people just being recruited as athletes to the schools they're supposed to be student athletes and be serious students too and yeah. so they have you have to have so many you know and the ncaa was actually harder to deal with the universities but originally what would happen is you would apply to a college and the university would certify to the ncaa that we're taking this homeschooler who has an unconventional education they meet our requirements and they we are going to enroll them and the ncaa would say oh okay and at some point, the NCAA decided they didn't like that, and homeschoolers had to start meeting the requirements that everybody else had to meet for minimum number of courses and things. So we had to make something that looked like what they were looking for. And it, you know, it, she was on the dean's list in college, so it wasn't like we pulled a fraud over them. We just had to repackage what she had done to be something that looked more familiar to 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 the university system. But I think we can even go back to the thing with the mothers. I think um, it's kind of our job as parents in homeschooling and especially unschooling families to kind of try to translate what we are doing into mm -hmm. a language and a form that people around us will understand. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's so far-fetched. It's such a crazy thing that... I get it. I get that people don't get it. They look at it and it looks like well, laziness. It's... It looks like vacation. It looks like we're sloppy. It looks like, I don't know what it looks like. It doesn't look normal. It, it, and you can't imagine what it is. So I find it to be my job to be able to plan after the fact, um, transform what we're doing. When I, when I talk to, for example, my mother-in-law or I don't know, people who would be worried and who wouldn't understand, but mm -hmm. would be really interested in how it's going. I have to do the work of mm -hmm. explaining or translating the facts of our life to something that can be absorbed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because there's, 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 there's almost like this weird resistance to comprehending. Oh, mm -hmm. like, one of the things that we used to do, because before I wrote the books, I was the newsletter editor. We did a, a 40 to 48 page newsletter that was actually more like a magazine that we sent out to the, the homeschool association. And that was a lot of fun. I learned a lot about, you know, and that was one of the reasons that I felt like I could write the book in the first place. Mm -hmm. And um, But one of the things we used to do was was translate education jargon so that people could throw it around appropriately. I was tickled when I learned about the concept of constructivism, the idea that students put their knowledge together in their own head, you know, where they take disparate things that they learn about and, and build it into sort some sort of mental structure in their head. And I thought, yes, that's what they're doing. Because I had a lot of people that said, well, how can you hey, teach history if you don't do it in chronological order? And I said, well, you go to a Ren Fair and you have kids get interested in costumes and then they start getting all interested in the Elizabethan period and the Tudors. And then they start reading history and then they start saying, well, what happened after that? And then they go look, start learning, you know, reading Shakespeare. <laughs> and, you know, it's like one thing leads to another, which leads to another. And then, that, you know, mentally, they they build a mental model for all this stuff they're taking in. And it's like, 
how do you learn things if you have a hobby and you're teaching yourself? That's yeah. just what kids are doing. You know, there was, the idea, there was the idea hmm? of the chronological order is also the idea that there is a right way to learn mm -hmm. things and there mm -hmm. is a right way to have it so that my and there's a right content that everybody yeah. needs to learn, which yeah, isn't so the case at all. My understanding of the history of the world has to be just like yours. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. And it's not, obviously, I have lived another life and, and in another place. And, and my mm -hmm. understanding, what I picked up is another version from another perspective. And that's okay. I think there's mm -hmm. something, it's the same thing with math. How can you make sure they know it all? Well, I mm -hmm. can't. But I, 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 what is it all? Who defines what everything is? It's, this well, idea, it's kind it of funny right. because just the, how adults have such a hard time understanding that. And I, I always like using the analogy of hobbies, you know, because if an adult is obsessing about some hobby and they're collecting things and they're cataloging things, they're, they're really engrossed in their hobby. And if a kid is doing the same sort of thing, they're obsessed by it and they're wasting their time doing it, you know, and it's like, what's the difference that one of them is 12 and one of them is 35? Oh, yes. Yeah. You know. Nothing. Nothing. And um, what, what we talked about here um, puzzles me uh, because I am, a, there's inside myself, there is a, a little annoyment with uh, having to uh, speak Etukanese to people. Uh, <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's all, it could come from compassion. Yeah, but I it believe has. it does. But yeah. at the same time, um, what, what annoys me is um, why that we are in a society where you're only worth something if you have some sort of merits. Uh, that that being a human being is not good enough. You need to have done stuff, and you need to be able to say this and that. And but at the same time. I also feel the need to protect and uh, be a spokesperson when people talk about unschooling. Mm -hmm. Then I, then I, uh, instead of when people asking, uh, so what about your kids? Uh, instead of me just saying, well, they're quite happy. They're content with life. And they, you have to prove that it worked. Yes. And <laughs> part of me is on just... a, it's good to do it. But I'm also in my back, I'm like, can't we just be happy really to be alive? Is, it really is a problem that there is this contrast between when people ask and we speak educationese and we try to explain, get the message across that they will learn to read and they will learn world history and all these things that, that normally are taught in schools. Then you, you hear yourself talk about this as if this was the agenda. And this mm -hmm. is the idea and the goal of our lifestyle. And it's not. It's just really, truly, my only goal was what they learn is not anywhere near as important as the fact that they learn how to learn. Mm. So that if they want to do something in the future, they know how to go about learning about it enough to be able to do whatever it is they want to do or just go exploring. They, you know, and which. It fits in with the whole. Hi, we're gonna we're gonna experience society instead of have, being in the classroom for, you know, however many hours a day, however many days a year, however many at a years. desk, or with the same age people. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have friends of different ages. We're gonna have opportunity to go out and talk to people. Um, one of the things that just used to drive us crazy, but made us laugh at the same time. You know, we'd go to a, like a fast food place or something to get sandwiches or something. And the kids would say, oh, I want to get an order of French fries. And they'd go up to the counter to order and be completely ignored because they were short and a child. And the assumption was that they were just there hanging out being a kid and that they weren't actually a customer, mm. you know, and that was always one of my bugaboos is I, I wanted to see kids treated as people. Yeah, yeah, uh, that can really be a problem. It mm -hmm. helps a lot when they grow, when they grow mm -hmm. tall. Yeah. 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 We have now only one left that is short. Yeah, and looked upon as a child. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. our daughter mm -hmm. 14, she's almost as tall as I am, and our son of 
17, he's much taller than both of us. And then we have a 24-year-old, obviously she is an adult. Yeah, she's just, And yeah. then there is the 11-year-old and he's struggling with this, you know, he's being looked at as if mm -hmm. his opinion doesn't work. matter, he can't go to the counter and order coffee and mm -hmm. people think well, if they see him drink wine and, you know. <laughs> that's the other thing we used to do a lot in public places and we, oh, museums were just painful to go, you know, because we'd go and we, you know, we're going to look at, at this stuff today and we didn't feel like we had any particular obligation to see the whole everything in the whole museum this day you know we didn't have to what, what's the phrase that i just the the phrase that you know because there's those homeschooler cliches too or the unschooler cliches i just want to make sure i expose my child to everything oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, it's like, and make sure they can you know, uh, complete their full potential or unleash. Yeah, their yeah, potential. or that everything full has to be and exposure. Yeah, mm. everything has to be worthwhile. Everything has to be a learning moment. No, sometimes mm. you just gotta play, and the play is the most important part. Mm. And you know, play is highly right. underrated. Yeah, yeah, but I also think we just talked about that before. How the education education is can be when you talk about it to try to explain the lifestyle mm -hmm. you talk about it as if as if the learning was the important part and if i if i talk about how they learn by playing or how they learn by just being mm -hmm. it, it seems as if what i want is the learning but it's not i want them to be and to stay with themselves and to feel that life is meaningful and to enjoy. And I, because I know this is what is important and I have no doubt that they will pick up lots of stuff. I have no worry at all. You, there, especially Christy. Christy learned things. I have no idea where she picked them up from. Mm -hmm. But she used to watch a lot of uh, nature shows and, you know, she, she was a much more visual learner also. And she was a very observant kid because, you know, and that was one of the fun things, too, is how different you discover your kids are. Because yeah. if you're not watching them learn, you know, you may not have the idea or you may not ever grasp that they're completely different learning styles. Because Kate, Kate was the type that would watch. She was like me, you know, where you'd watch everything and then when you finally jumped into something, you could do it perfectly because you'd spent so much time watching all the details and stuff, mm. you know, because you couldn't do it wrong, which is I'll something that took me that. took me yeah. 10 years to recover from being a school, an uh, excellent school student, you know, and actually learn how to learn. I think that's one of the things that improved, Im mm -hmm. influenced my unschooling move was being what, what the school system considered a highly successful student and feeling like I hadn't learned anything, mm. you know, and then... Yeah. Uh, Christy, Christy was dangerous around a swimming pool when she was a little kid because she was the type to just leapt into anything. To she, you know, yeah, if you had to be in the pool so you could catch her when she came running and jumping in <laughs> before she learned how to swim. When when you Mary mentioned the museums earlier, it made me think about a dialogue I had with the, the owner of this place we are right now. Right now, we are in France, in Normandy, at a uh, castle. Uh, where mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, I figured are... the wall behind you did not look like a van. No, no. absolutely not. No, no, we are attending uh, a co-living month together with other mm. people from world school and most of them on school. And it's just wonderful children to be around. So we are 13 mm -hmm. families. I think there is something about 20, 35 children at the castle. It's yeah. quite a lot of children. Mm -hmm. And the owner doesn't have children. No, so she was. She had no idea what she was. Yeah, and she, she actually <laughs> said to me, "You know what? I actually never liked children before, really, because they are loud, they are messy, and all that." And I was actually thinking about that, and uh, also seeing my own experience with seeing school children on excursions, for example, to a museum or a park or somewhere where they actually are not very uh, nice towards each other. They're very loud they're and not, stuff like that. They're not nice to the park either. No. And what I've been thinking about is if they, they these excursions, where there's two adults away with 35 children and they can run mm -hmm. out to a corner, is the only And I don't know if they do the same thing in, in Europe, but school groups going to museums have worksheets where they have to fill in the blanks to yeah. prove that they've seen everything yeah, there. And it's like... That. 
No, yeah. but I don't know. I can't speak for all of Europe. No, nope. a lot of different. No, but, but but that's it's very common. We would we would yeah, see all but, these groups go, and then they're running around trying to mm -hmm. find everything, and they're but, very noisy. And yeah, my point is that it is uh, they are finally not controlled. Or mm -hmm. they think they are not. They think they are not controlled. Mm -hmm. So they have a moment of freedom where they are not used to being not uh, overseen and or controlled all mm -hmm. the time. So yes, they make a lot of noise and they are maybe not the best version of because... uh, children. And mm -hmm. that's what was fun with Katya when she, the owner here, when she met all these unschooled children, she was like, can children like... be like that? They, they are really mm -hmm. fun and interesting to talk to. And she's mm -hmm. a you board can have gamer. 35 children of all ages, mostly above age of 12, to run around a real French castle, not breaking anything. And my own Therefore, experience my with homeschool groups, you know, when we'd get together in groups like that with a bunch of kids, one of the things I always thought was just fascinating to watch was how the kids played with each other because they would make allowances for the different capabilities of, of yeah. the different kids. Yeah. You know, if they're yeah. they're playing some game that they're making up the rules for and a couple people couldn't read yet, they would, you know, well, you can be this. And, and you know, mm -hmm. it would, there wasn't any embarrassment that some, you know, just oh. some kids read and some kids didn't, you know, it was just one of the things that happened. And it didn't really matter what age you learned to read, because once you did, you could. And, no mocking and no embarrassment. Yeah. 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 You you know, I mean, there were, there were tiffs and things. Sometimes people would get into disagreements, but as a general rule, they were very mm -hmm. non-judgmental about each other. Mm -hmm. And kind. I, I see them mm -hmm. from a point of kindness towards mm -hmm. each other all the time. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. It's been yeah, wonderful. Some of, the, some of the parents I had issues with. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. But that's a different problem. But, that's you know, and there, there's always, you know, the, the thing, the danger you have with unschooling in, at least in a suburban setting, like I grew up with, you know, where you get together for play days and things and things. And there's always somebody that's, that's the rule maker. You know, you're not a real unschooler if you're not doing this, you know, and there was the one mom that had to buy a new microwave because she didn't believe in teaching her child anything, you know, so instructing the child not to put metal objects into the microwave would have been teaching. suppressing her. Yeah, it would have been teaching and that would have been okay. suppressing her learning instinct. It's like, no, that's a safety precaution, lady. You don't yeah. want to start a fire. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's like ballet. If your kid wants to learn ballet you would be irresponsible to try to teach them yourself unless you knew ballet mm. you know because you're doing things to the muscles and joints and stuff mm. that you need somebody that you know like i couldn't teach my kids defense no you know if they want to learn it and that would have been you, dangerous something yeah, <laughs> yeah some things some things require expertise and there's nothing wrong with expertise no Mary, a, a thing I would like to talk about is uh, us, the parents, uh, mm -hmm. and you as, as a parent, because often when we talk about unschooling, we talk about what is we believe is best for a young human being to their way to go through life. I have in my life found that the further down I'm going this unschooling rabbit hole, uh, the more happy I am as a person. I'm, I'm freeing mm -hmm. myself. And now you have uh, grown up uh, on school children. So how have your personal journey been? Uh, is there something specific you have learned uh, about yourself, of your freed yourself up? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, partly, I thought, I thought the 10 years after I was out of school and I was learning how to learn, basically, and how to explore stuff because I wasn't being told this is what you need to learn. I thought that had taken care of things. But there's still, you get inculcated with this whole idea of should, you know, things are supposed to be this way and things are supposed to be that way. And, and my kids both went through stages where they felt odd enough sometimes that they felt like maybe they should be doing things differently. And I said, well, how do you want to be doing things? And they said, well, we don't know, just different from where we <laughs> are. Um, I don't think I could have done the stuff I did in fencing, you know, and dealing with different kinds of people and, and 
just in the numbers and the intensity of some of that if I hadn't been dealing with the unschooling approach to things. It's like it made me very pragmatic about what works and what doesn't. And, mm. and it's like I am never, ever going to run out of things to do. Yeah. I have so much stuff that I want to do. <laughs> yeah, I know. And you know how you get up in the morning and you think today's the day, nothing in the calendar. I'm totally going to do all of my things. And then somehow mm -hmm. it's four in the afternoon. And I don't mm -hmm. really know how that happened, but it's four in the afternoon. And uh -huh. soon I have oh, to if you if you look, I I mostly because I've had cat I had cataract surgery about a year ago. So but my eyes were getting really bad before then. So I I hardly ever read real books anymore. It's all electronic books because I can adjust the the type size and stuff. Yeah. I have got so many books that I haven't read yet on there, but they're always with me, you know. <laughs> That's the good thing with the e-reader. You can have like yeah. thousands yeah. of books. Oh, it was great when I was traveling for fencing because I used to have half a dozen different books in my suitcase, you know, mm -hmm. and it would be heavy and it would take mm -hmm. up a lot of room. Mm -hmm. And when I went electronic, it's like, I can bring a lot more books <laughs> and it just take out of room and they're always there. And yeah. that was very slick. Yeah. But I think, I think basically being an unschooling parent turned me into an unschooler myself, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you learn that. I don't know. I, that it I became more stop. confident too about what I knew and less shy because I was an excruciatingly shy child until I was in my late 20s, basically. It was almost painful for me to just even make a phone call. Mm. And, you know, and then 10 years ago, you would have found me in a convention hall with 10,000 people in it, mm -hmm. you know, yelling at, not yelling, but, you know, I'm, I'm on the microphone telling people where the next finals <laughs> Wow. That was yeah. going to be, you know, and it just, it's like, I'm not afraid, mm. you know, pe people are terrified of public speaking and I just think it's a hoot, you yeah. know, and that's something that wouldn't have happened turned out to be okay. It wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been doing this mm -hmm. other stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and when, like when, when, when I did my second book after you know, after I did the, here's what you need to think about if you're doing homeschooling, you know, and there was the, if you want to do school at home, this is the kind of thing. And here's kind of a midway and here's the unschooling thing. And they said to me after, after that book turned out to be a success, somewhat to their surprise, the publisher's surprise, they said, what do you want to do next? And I said, I want to do an unschooling book. And I said, it needs to have unschooling in the title. Mm. And I don't, I'm not one of those people that feels really strongly about the terminology that you use or anything, but at that point in time, the word needed to be on the book in order to, to become known what it was, Yeah, you know, so they called it after they had called the first book, the homeschooling handbook, which was not a title I liked. And it turned out that when you, when publishers make up titles for books, because the authors don't get to pick the titles, of course, it's the publishers aren't aiming at the ultimate retail customer. They're aiming at the book buyers that are buying the book for the distributors. And, you know, they want, mm -hmm. they want the title to grab the salespeople who are selling it to the bookstores. Cool. And so that's why it was called the hun unschooling handbook, but I did get the cover that I wanted, which was the, there are people that don't like the cartoony thing, but it was the how to world, use the whole world as your child's classroom. I liked the subtitle. Mm. Oh, yes. Mm. And we do as well with our full-time mm -hmm. traveling yes. life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what's what's even better is when they redid the, the next, they wanted me to do a new edition of the first book. And basically we updated a lot of the the resources, which now, of course, are grotesquely out of date being, you know, over 25 years old. It's like, of yeah, course. some of the some of the links to websites are not going to be accurate. <laughs> we actually had somebody somebody wrote a outraged letter to the publisher saying, I went to this support group site and it's a porn site. <laughs> it's like they looked into it and it's like the the, the Internet company had got bought by some yeah, other yeah, company yeah. that turned everybody's websites into porn sites, apparently. <laughs> they just shut everybody down and turned it into this yeah. completely different thing. You know, and that's the sort of thing, you know, time, over time, things happen and there's not anything you can get in control of. But they did get rid of the pencil and I got a kid with a magnifying glass looking at a ladybug. That's better. And that made me much happier too, so. 
Okay. And of course, then my nice independent publisher got bought by Penguin Random House. So since then, I have had any. Yes. And I and they are still earning royalties, much to my surprise. You know, they've kept me in computer upgrades all these years. <laughs> and that's you know, you know, which is which is one of the fun things about homeschooling parents years ago, you know, where I was I was what was the phrase they used? I was making money off of homeschoolers. You know, and yeah. people Yeah. And people that's a, that's evil. That, I'm supposed to be thing? donating all this knowledge and things. It's like mm-hmm. um you know, it turns out that if you go to a conference, you have expenses. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's like, you, hi guys. If you, you know, and it took me a certain amount of time to bills. do all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and yeah. one thing, uh, as Cecilia is a psychologist and have coached a lot of people on their unschooling or homeschooling journey, um, it is as we love this so much, we we actually would like to help people, but. As we then are public about it, and Cecilia has been writing her blog for more than 12 years, and there's a lot of content out there. People reach out and ask questions. And sometimes you're like, I really want to answer this, but I also really want to be together with my children. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, of course, it is okay to say, hey, I actually do not know you. And I love that you also want to homeschool, but I'm homeschooling because I want to be together with my children. So uh, it so took I me a while, but I got, I got really, I got really good at referring people to my book for questions that the answers to the questions they were asking I were totally in the book. Write a book. Yeah. That was <laughs> yeah. you know, or, your or the blog, you know, handbook. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the Viking unschool yeah. version. Yeah, mm-hmm. whatever. I'll come up with something. Yeah. That will help. <laughs> Yeah, because then you can just say, go read it first and we can show the book. Yeah. 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 It's no, just I like, really, I would do it. I would, I love to help people get started or move mm-hmm. on, feel comfortable. And just on school relax journey, but, a little bit, you know, because yeah. it's really hard when you're first starting out it's and you're so, so worried, hard. you know, you're going to warp your child or, you know, and children are really There's resilient. So you're allowed to make moments. mistakes. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that, you know, that's one of the issues that I always had a hard time with, too, was the people that said, well, how do you maintain your authority over your children? I said, well, they're part of the family. It's like we discuss things. Mm, I don't need authority. You no, know, obedience is not a quality I value in my children. <laughs> it's not on the curriculum. Obedience. No. No. <laughs> Please. Living, living well with other people, learning to live cooperatively with people is a value I, I hold high. Yeah. But you will do this because I tell you is not something that worked in our. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. Our kids, they have a favorite book called The Name of the Wind. All four of them just love that book. And who's the author? The- that sounds so familiar. Oh, it's almost registering. Ah, shit. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, Patrick. Ro- is it Patrick Rothfuss? Yes. The storyteller guy? Yeah. And yeah I I'm so annoyed. He has not finished the trilogy. Could he come up with the third one, please? Yes. Yeah. We're looking for it. But one of their favorite cro- quotes, they will say it out loud whenever it's relevant, is when, quote, he says, um, there is nothing as nauseating as pure obedience. It's a beautiful quote. We don't yep, like becoming that. all too relevant these days around. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's, let's not think about we don't that. need to go into that yet. No. Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but but Mary, the, um, I think not any longer now. We are ten years down the road, and I can look at our uh, oldest son, who is the one who has never been to school uh, the whole period of never been mm-hmm. to school. Um. Earlier, I was, you know, of course, a little sometimes afraid. Will they ever succeed? Uh, what? Mm-hmm. In, in, yeah, that's it. That, that <laughs> was the fear installed in me that I was thinking, will they be able to take care of themselves? Will they be able to make a living? And so, what would you suggest to people on that journey, on the unschooling journey, uh, that have all this? It's, it's we still different. It's no different from schooled kids. I know a gazillion people who had kids whose kids finished 
college and they were, they had a job, but they weren't sure what they wanted to do. And sometimes they ended up, you know, feeling kind of lost for a while. And it's like, people figure out what they want to do. Hmm. And, you know, grownups do too. <laughs> <laughs> maybe at some point <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I was like my my older daughter was was you know she she fenced for a year or so and then she was injured and it was a, one of those long-term you know uh, uh yeah. muscle tear that took like six months to resolve and she had to do a lot of stretching and stuff and she got interested in theater at the time so she was doing community theater and she ended up going to theater school in New York had a great time and realized when she graduated that she didn't like hanging out with actors, <laughs> which is kind of a pro problem, Yeah, you know, in the profession. And she was also interested in costuming and stuff, but she didn't think she wanted to do that professionally. And she ended up working in a couple of retail places. And then she ended up working at the Strand Bookstore, which is this huge new and used bookstore in New York. And she met her now husband there. And they ended up moving back to Philadelphia, where he was from. And she worked for a small family and in independent bookstore there for a long time. And then this publishing company that she works for now had an opening there. And there, it's like, it's almost like they're an unschooled publishing company. It's, you know, but it took her a while to find where she was going is the point. You know, it's like she tried different things and she doesn't but know she'll stay one with of you. these fake ideas actually part of the whole you don't graduate from college stuff. finished no and you nobody's don't, finished you don't when they're 18 and then you're and there. 22. it's like yeah it's you know which is the whole point and then you're safe life is yeah. very long and, and or the idea that things can happen the idea that you finished learning as soon as you finished school it's like you and know then, and, if and you it's, get a job then you're good then like we can take the yeah. job life it's is like, okay but maybe it will change three years later or five years later you mm -hmm. realize you don't like actors or mm -hmm. so many people do a career shift or get a divorce or mm -hmm. decide to travel the world or become a monk or whatever it's not like the first that i used to do conferences and people would want me to sign books which I always, I still think is kind of weird. It's like, okay, yeah, I'll sign your book. But you, you know, you kind of have to say something too if you're inscribing the book, yeah. you know? And, and what I settled on eventually was enjoy the adventure. And <clears throat> people usually took it as, as enjoy the adventure with your kids, which was true, but it was also just enjoy the adventure of life. Yeah. You know, it applies to everybody mm. because you're not done, you know, and that was that, you know, if I could get one thing through to anybody with my books, especially the unschooling handbook, um, I don't count viral learning, which is the one I did mostly for the contributors to the other two books and for myself, which was sort of a, you know, what do I think now that I've officially finished homeschooling my kids? And, and it was more like, you know, we're going to keep going. You know, it's because if you're not still learning, you might as well not still be breathing because mm. it's, it's as natural and as needed a part of life as breathing, yeah. is yeah. learning. I really like the Sandra Dodd uh, yearly challenge in July, mm -hmm. the Learn mm -hmm. Nothing Day. It's so much fun. <laughs> I can't you remember. follow it and social media when, everybody failing within the first hours of their waking hours it's just so back funny. back in the old uh, old days when we were all on AOL and, and that's that's how that's partly how I got into the book too is there was a whole raft of us all over the United States and a few people in in Europe too mostly mostly the United States though but back mm -hmm. in the it's in the AOL dial-up days you know where you'd listen to that the modem yeah. shrieking I remember yeah. you know and Sandra Dodd was there and Linda Dobson and sometimes Pat Frank or other people from Growing Without Schooling, but all, all different states. <clears throat> and that's where I got a lot of the contributors for my books that answered this ungodly long questionnaire about, you know, what do you do and why you do it and how well does it work and do you hate it? And, you know, what, what works and what doesn't and what's fun and what's not and what do you worry about and what do you have to tell your parents? And everybody answered, you know, I did. So when I figured I was done officially with my kids. I sent out another question to some of that and other people and said, how did it work? And so it was, it was basically a book just for us. It was never anything that I, I tried to market. You can buy it on, on Amazon and through bookshop 
Oregon and places like that, but it's not anything I ever pushed. And I think I've sold a couple hundred copies is all, but it was sort of a, now that I'm done, what do I think? And it's like, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the same journey, basically. Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, I am and try not curious. to listen to too many people that make up rules for how it's supposed to be done, because yeah. there aren't any except paying attention to the kids and treating your kids like people. And the other rule, the other rule that I think doesn't get mentioned enough is you have to like spending time with your kids. That is so important. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if you don't like spending time with your kids, then you're going to start telling them things that you think you should be doing. And that's, that gets you into disaster. Yeah, probably. Who doesn't like spending time with their kids? I work that out of like work. That. I was the going to work that, uh, and I haven't been in an office for five years, which is wonderful. But I remember mm -hmm. how it was coming home drained from work, uh, mm -hmm. and it, it it could feel a little more up in your face because you weren't used to it. And mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say to the defense of uh, parents and fathers out there, if oh. you live in that life. Where you don't know school, you don't know how it is to just enjoy and relax and i remember mm -hmm. actually we have talked about it often cecilia and i i the swift the shift that happened when we decided to keep our school, uh, kids home all the time in the start we thought that uh, they should go to a world of um, mm -hmm. this is before kindergarten. school age so yeah the, well it's complicated but they were fairly young <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was it's like a, a kindergarten. Uh, yeah, two yeah. and five and a baby. Yeah, yeah. I, I think of I think of of Waldorf sometimes as a gateway to drug to unschooling. Mm -hmm. Except if you stay in it too long, they do and get kind of rigid. Some of them kind of a about what yeah. things you know because they can get yeah. very precise about what things you're allowed to do mm -hmm. at what ages and things, and that doesn't work for every kid. I don't like it either. No, no, it's but that was our general. It was actually not really a Waldorf. School. It was yeah, with school, with yeah. with the matter. younger ages, you know, the some of the Montessori stuff is it's like it's good, but it it's still can get school. rigid depending. The thing on, is, yeah. it's still a school. Yeah. It's still strangers. It still has a curriculum. It still has structure. It still has planning on behalf of other people. Even mm -hmm. though it's nicer, it's to me it's obviously it still nicer, has some, but yeah. it's still a school, and I wouldn't send my kids there. My point being, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what women well, inter get interrupt to men? Get to your <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not always good at getting straight to the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm wiggling a little around. My point being, I remember how it was to shift uh, from not sending them to school, and it actually started to feel like vacation. And when I now look back, on the life we led back then, I'm not sure how we did it without being super stressed out. On we were people. super stressed yeah. out. Yeah, and you just don't but, know it sometimes, how much you're stressed. Yeah, but I remember, you know, I woke up before I was happy waking up. Uh, I like to sleep to around eight or something, maybe seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but I needed to go up early to make sure to wake up the kids that weren't ready. And I needed to get them dressed and food and down to the, this kindergarten. And from there, I needed to bike to work. And all that should happen before nine. And, mm -hmm. and it is wild that people think of this as normal still. And I did back then. But when I look at it now, I'm like, wow, today I prefer my mornings to be but you're, Slow, you're I'm good. drifting off your point because I've guessed your point. Come with it. Your point is that once we took the children out of kindergarten, what, the change was you didn't have to drop them off on your way to work. But yeah. the big change was that when you came back, you had children that were totally balanced. They didn't need to reestablish a connection yeah. because the connection was not broken in the morning. They had enough energy and and presence to just have fun. You know, we would meet in the park. You would drive his bike to the park and meet us there. Or we would, you know, have a casual pizza somewhere. It was not like this. And they had to be in bed at a certain time because we had to wake them up at a certain time. So once they came out of the kindergarten, they stopped. Basically, they stopped being annoying. Yeah. 
so I get why people don't want to be around their children because I think the children they haven't really seen how their children act. It's not real. They're children. not stressed. They, they're just stressed out. Everybody is stressed. Yeah. 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 I and, wouldn't want and, to be around <clears> them either. I think. And it's funny when when I was. I can remember being in meetings and people complaining about being in meetings. It's, it's so terrible to have to sit here for an hour to be in a meeting, you know, store managers or whatever. You know, it's like, and you're sending your kids to school and they're essentially sitting in a meeting for how many hours a day? And you think that's fine, but you can't yeah. take an hour. Yeah. yeah. It's like, and basically you leave them there in the morning before you even go to the work. Mm hmm. And you pick them up. Some people even, you know, they go to work and then they take a yoga class and then they go shopping and then they pick up the children. So the And then they get mad at their kids being cranky when they go shopping. Yeah. <laughs> it it's like, fun. yeah. You have to consider what your kids are, you know, your three-year-old is not really going to be good for an eight-hour day plus then another shopping trip and stuff. You can't push kids beyond what they're capable of well, but, but you don't that, know what they're capable of until you let I, them. Yeah, I would have a tantrum if I had to do that. Mm -hmm. Mary, um, I preach. Well, yeah, sometimes too many things are happening in my mind. So <laughs> let me put one thing out first. Uh, for people listening, uh, I constantly uh, looking sometimes at some music in instruments behind you. Who is playing? Is it you? Those are mine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I start. I I had a ukulele. I, I've I've started and given up a number of instruments over the years because I've had a keyboard and I had a, a fiddle for a while, a violin, and I got further with the ukulele than anything else. And then I thought I like banjo, so I got a banjo and I thought I would be playing bluegrass, but it turned out I like claw hammer better. And I played claw hammer for a while, and then I happened to come across. Irish and the Irish tenor banjo seems to have stuck. So some of the others I don't use that much anymore, but I, I'm still, I'm not able to play in public yet, but I can actually, actually play a couple of tunes now, but it's Maybe relatively you could new. Play in but public. it really, um, I'm not willing to yet. Let's At put least it that in the way. Park, you know. I cannot, I, I cannot hit. Oh yeah, I could do that, but, but mm -hmm. I, I can't get to speed yet. You know, I'm, it's it's much easier than it used to be, and my hands are my fingers are getting stronger and stuff. But I've got a uh, there's an Irish banjo player named Enda Skull that does video lessons. That I mean, they're not person, they're not live, but they're recorded. And he's, there's this thing called Sound Slice, which is really cool, where you can get the music, and he has the video that plays while the music scrolls, and um, you get like a you can you can do loop it so you can practice particular things yeah. all the time and and how much of this did you learn in school to get back to oh it none of it none <laughs> of it none of it i did play clarinet in school very badly yeah but i also then when i hit high school i had scoliosis and i had to wear a, a neck to hip brace oh. which was wow. which was better than having the surgery the surgery put you in a cast for 9 months and i was happy not to do that because yeah. the the brace wow. i could actually take off and take a bath and stuff yeah wow. but um you can't be in a marching band very well when you can't move your spine at all you know nope. and so i couldn't actually play the clarinet i could only hold it while i was in the marching band and i decided i did not like being in band and got myself out of that which is the one one tiny bit of control I had over my education, I guess, was I got out of band. Yeah. But I've always One liked music. I've just do. never been very good at it. But, but the banjo, I'm also interested in natural history. I'm really interested in um, indigenous history. There's, there's, there's a chunk of the town I live in that used to be a village where you can go out and see grinding rocks where they would grind acorns for the, because acorn mush was one of the staples of the diet. Mm -hmm. of the Nisanan people that lived here, you know, so I'm really interested in the natural history and the indigenous history and just, I'm not going to do anything with it. It's just really interesting. Yeah. You don't have you know, to, you just do it because you like it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. It's one of the really wonderful things about homeschooling, unschooling is that you, when you turn back on, when you succeed in turning back on the curiosity uh, as a person, mm -hmm. I, that's what I love the most. 
Yeah. Be very frustrating. You know, it, no. you know, I, I and you know how I said, about. you know how I said obedience was not a something I valued in my kids. Curiosity yeah. is the substitute. Mm. Mm. I want I wanted kids who were curious and knew how to indulge their curiosity. Yeah. I want to loop something back and then we should kind of close off. But the, the loop back is we, we talked about this with the children when we came home to them. They, they weren't annoying because they were relaxed and unstressed. And it made me think about um, back before we got teenagers, a lot of people said, oh, wait till they get teenagers. It will be so difficult. And it has and been teenagers so, are so horrible and, and I might I, and they are so wonderful I people love to be around teenagers they're the best it's so much fun to be the parent of teenagers mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. we really sometimes sum it up to is that but we haven't given given them anything to rebel against um so the, mm -hmm. the rebellion is not wait there a little bit yeah. You never know. You never but we know. have a really great relation with our teens mm -hmm. and I think that our teens they just very interesting to talk to they are mm -hmm. mm, it's nice i had more adults in the family my though. kids got frustrated sometimes when they were teens but it was more because they were having trouble with something they were trying to do themselves so like like christy was hilarious when she was fencing and she was never as good as she wanted to be and we would have these conversations all the way home. You know, and it, it, it was definitely teenage years. It's like, I need to quit. I don't deserve to be a fencer. I don't deserve to be fencing. I need to quit. I'm going to quit. And I'd always say, okay, you can quit. If you still want to quit in two weeks, you can quit. But, you know, we got to go through the month that we've paid for, you know, and if you still want to quit in two weeks, you know, and the next day it's like, I got to go. I got to get better, you know, <laughs> so you yeah. see. but, you know, yeah. it's, that kind of frustration that they had, it wasn't against the way they were living or anything. It was more a struggle with something they were trying to be good at or something they wanted to do that they hadn't quite figured out how to do yet. And that was it's something that you, to be that's okay. something you can work with. Yeah. 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 A lot of things happen when you're a teenager. Um, we are trying to keep uh, these talks to around an hour, but I would love to to end on your advice to new uh, parents who are down the homeschooling, unschooling road. Uh, where would you suggest they should start? Trust yourselves. Trust your kids. Mm. The trust that things will work out is so important because you've got to let it go for a while. You know, it's one of the things we used to talk about. I don't know if the homeschool groups still talk about it because I haven't been, I got too many other things I want to do besides. <laughs> well, you've done it. But, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but one of the things we all, you know, if you were taking your kids out of school and, and I know Sandra Dodd talks about it a lot too, is, is um, the vacation, you know, and, and people tried to make up rules for it too. You know, like as many years as your child was in school, you should take that many weeks or that many months and not try to do anything at all and just decompress from whatever was going on before, you know, but, but the parents need to do that too. You can't, you can't just take your kid out of school and suddenly miracles will happen. No. It's, it's a process that has to be allowed to develop and to grow. And, and you can't force it. That. And I also think when you mentioned the word trust, I always said that in the relation we have with our children, the trust is the most valuable asset, kind of. If we don't mm -hmm. trust each other, if I don't trust them and they don't trust me, it's actually dangerous. Mm -hmm. I have, If I am to take care of them, I need them to trust me. So I have to be trustworthy, which means I mm -hmm. can't let out bullshit from here it has mm -hmm. to come it has to be authentic it has to be true i have to know that i'm right if i say something is a fact and and i have to trust them if they say this doesn't make any sense to me or i don't want to do that or i'd rather do this i have to trust that that is the right thing for them to do or that at least if i can't understand it they will be able to explain to me why it's right so I always thought it was really helpful trying to get people to forget the idea of the family as an authoritarian entity and think of it as a community. It's a community yeah. of people who are living together and everybody's got contributions to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And roles to play. Mm -hmm. 
And, that, and they change. Um, they change. Sometimes, sometimes your kids are taking care of things for you. Yeah. Sometimes they surprise you. Like there was one time where I can't remember. Dave and I went someplace and Christy stayed home by herself. And we got back. She completely cleaned the house. She says, I just thought I'd surprise you. Oh, it's like, yeah. huh. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Playing has never been one of my joys. <laughs> It's not my favorite thing either. I live in a van. It takes me yeah. half an hour, then it's sexy. There's certain things you have to do in order to, to well, stay it's just in a small the place. The house that I have yeah. is so small. If uh -huh. I have to clean it completely, I mean, I could spend two hours. We could spend it's two hours, hour. but yeah. then it would be sparkling. Yeah, mm -hmm. And that would be it. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to do that either. I want to yeah. hang out with my kids. So uh, go play my game. On that right? note, yeah. On let's that note, Mary, let's uh, if you could mention where people can find more information about you and your books and the work. Okay, you're... I actually have two websites. There's marygriff.com, which is the easy one to remember, and there's a link to my other blog because I can't. <laughs> it's the viral learning blog. It's the one that's specifically about homeschooling. So all the homeschooling stuff is there, and the other one is a more general one where it's got homeschooling and fencing and politics and all sorts of stuff. But there's a link to the homeschooling one, the we education can put related both links one. In the notes. Yeah, we will put yeah. Both, uh, links yeah. in the notes. And they. I post on there very irregularly anymore. Just if okay. something strikes me that I am in, like ah. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. or or what usually gets me these days are what I think of as the research, which is, you know, somebody's published a study that says it turns out that play is important for kids and they learn a lot from through play. Duh. And I go, duh. <laughs> it's like duh ask an unschooler, they could have told you that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so it's it's partly my my anti-academic bias, but there's there's stuff like that 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 just, oh, oh you've learned something obvious and you've proved it now. Cool. <laughs> Good for you. It's yeah. one thing for five years uh, to do wonderful. it. Mary, I think that's a wonderful place to uh, stop. We want to thank you for your books and the time you have given us today. It has been a pleasure chatting with you. Anytime. It's been fun. It's 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 fun dipping into past worlds sometimes too, because I don't I don't often connect much with with homeschoolers in large groups although I still talk to them occasionally but it, you know it's not it's not a major part of my life anymore so it's fun to of sort course. of dip in but you are to be considered an expert still though <laughs> so it's been nice to talk to you <laughs> thank you for listening we hope you enjoyed today's episode and if you like them then please share it with all your friends and family we would also love it if you gave our podcast a review thanks and if you want to support our podcast and work, then you can find us on patreon.com slash the Conrad family. We will continue to travel full time. And if you want to tag along, then please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Conrad family. And you can also read more than 100 blog posts on our website, theconrad.family. Until next time, make a wonderful day. Thank you.